okay so <laughs> pray that it doesn't go again so i is equals to dq by dt okay so as i have said rotation of the electron produces a current and due to that current there will be a magnetic dipole moment okay so what is the definition for current it is the rate of flow of charge rate of flow of charge d by dt is actually called as rate okay so rate of flow of charge is called as current and thus you have what is the charge you have what well, this is an instantaneous current but if you talk about average current it is just q by t okay where q is the charge and t is the time in which the amount of charge that has flown okay so what is q here here q is e and e is the charge of the uh, charge on an electron is e okay and t is the time period of the rotation of the charge that means from here to here if if it starts from here it, it requires the time t to come back to the same position t is the uh, amount of time that is required to come back to the same position that is called as time period so i is equals to e by t okay i is equals to e by t so let this be my equation number 1 okay so now we know that what is time period how do we define time period or what is time from our equation for time in terms of velocity and uh, velocity and distance time is equals to distance upon velocity right from our newtonian mechanics we know that time is equals to distance upon velocity so in this case what is the distance this electron is traveling uh, before coming back to the same position so if it starts at a okay if the electron starts moving from a then how much time it requires to come back to the same point a in this orbit okay so that will be equal to the circumference of this orbit right and if i call the radius of this orbit as small r then how much will be the distance it will be traveling it will be equal to the circumference of that orbit and how much is the circumference of that orbit circumference is 2 pi r is the circumference of that orbit so here time period will be 2 pi r upon if v is the velocity of the ele electron angular velocity of the electron it will be v therefore t will be equals to 2 pi r upon v let this be equation number 2 and now put 2 in 1 substitute equation number 2 in 1 you will get the equation for the current so using 2 in 1 we get what do we get i is equals to e by 2 pi r upon v where 2 pi r upon v is time period t so therefore i can write current i as equal to e v by 2 pi r e v by 2 pi r is the current that is flowing due to the rotation of the revolution of the electron i is equals to e v by 2 pi r is the amount of current that is flowing in this orbit okay so if you have understood this then you can uh, now write the expression for the magnetic dipole moment so because of this circulating current there will be a magnetic dipole moment associated okay and how much will be that magnetic dipole moment so we can write this as because of this current 
there is a there is a associated magnetic dipole moment mu l okay we are not using the symbol m here rather we are using the symbol m in this sorry we are using the symbol mu l in this case so therefore mu l will be equals to what mu l will be equals to i times a okay i times a we will just write the scalar form of this magnetic dipole moment so what is my i from equation number 3 i is e v by 2 pi r and what is the area area of that loop okay or the area of the orbit this is the nucleus that e electron moving at a velocity v with the radius r around the loop of radius r or orbit of radius r then this will be what will be the area of this if r is the radius it will be pi r squared so from here r and r you can cancel pi and pi gets cancelled e v by 2 this is the magnetic dipole moment okay this is the magnetic dipole moment but this magnetic dipole moment is not the correct one because the charge of the electron i have taken it to be positive actually it is negative right it is minus e is equals to minus 1.6 into 10 is to minus 19 coulomb for electron right for electron so it will be minus e all right where v is the velocity of the electron but now in this equation since i have used the subscript l sorry uh, subscript l since i have used i have to get that l into this equation that is to tell you that the magnetic dipole moment the magnetic dipole moment depends on the angular momentum of the electron okay it depends on the angular momentum of the electron which is rotating around the nucleus in a definite orbit so how am, am i going to get the l into this so for that what you need to do is you need to multiply and divide this equation by here r is also there i guess yes r is also so in this case you have to multiply what is the equation for l what is the equation for the angular momentum from your 11th standard if you can remember the equation for angular momentum is mvr m e v r where m e is the mass of the electron v is the velocity and r is the radius of the electron and i need to get this m e v r or l in this equation so what will i do i will multiply and divide by m e or i will multiply and divide by the mass of the electron so we'll get this equation b equation number 4 so in this we multiply and divide by the mass of the electron so what we will get new l is equals to minus e by 2 m e multiplied by m e v r what i have done i have taken this minus e by 2 uh, at one side and v are on the other side and m e m e i have multiplied and divided so that m e m e if i if i cancel that off then we are left with the same equation number 4 okay so thus in this you can say this is l and therefore you get a relationship between magnetic dipole moment and the angular momentum as minus e by 2 m e 
where e is the subscript okay e is the subscript used e is not the part of the equation e is the subscript used that indicates that m e is the mass of the electron multiplied by l and now if i take this this is the equation for the magnetic dipole moment so you have to remember this equation so that can be a question from this part okay a question can be framed on this equation number 5 from this only we can get two physical quantities or two parameters or we can also say call them as constants two fundamental constants that we will be using in our study of nuclear physics okay so one constant is called as the gyromagnetic ratio and the other one is called as the bohr's magneton okay these are the two constants that comes frequently in our study of nuclear physics or you can say neutron physics okay so that means reactor physics and all nuclear power reactors and all this two constants very frequently the physicists encounter this two constants so this constants are uh, one is gyromagnetic ratio and gyromagnetic ratio is nothing but it is mu l di divided by l is called as the gyromagnetic ratio so gyro magnetic ratio what is it gyromagnetic ratio mu l by l is equals to minus 2 me by sorry minus e by 2 me this is called as the gyromagnetic ratio equation number 6 this is my gyromagnetic ratio so what is the value of it just calculate and tell me what is the value of it so in this if you just substitute the mass of the electron and the charge on the electron you will get what is the what is this constant what is that constant equal to can anybody just calculate and comment so this constant if you substitute e is equals to 1.6 into 10 is to minus 19 divided by 2 multiplied by mass of the electron is 9.1 into 10 is to minus 31 kg this is in coulombs so thus you will get a constant value thus this constant is called as a gyromagnetic ratio and it is always a constant value and what is that value equal to 8.8 into 10 is to 10 coulomb per kg 8.8 into 10 is to 10 coulomb per kg for the electron okay this is the gyromagnetic ratio of the electron all right and the other constant is called as the bohr's magneton and how do we get it so that we will get So is this clear? Has anybody got the value? Eight point eight into ten is to ten coulomb per kg. So the next thing is your Bohr's magneton. And what is that Bohr's magneton? Let us see. so you know that every i don't know if you all have studied it in your chemistry classes or not bohr's quantization principle bohr's quantization principle or it is one of the postulates of niels bohr atomic model so there were several models of atom that were put forward by different physicists as and when 
they studied they published their research data and thus there were so many different models that were published so the first one was put forward by thomson that was called uh, jj thomson that was called as plum pudding model then later on uh, ernest rutherford studied the gold foil uh, scattering of gold foil was the experiment conducted by ernest rutherford and that through that experiment the results of it he studied and gave a new model of the atom which says there is a massive center at the uh, core of every atom and that massive center is called as the he named that massive center as the nucleus okay and then there were certain improvisations to the rutherford's atomic model that was put forward by niels bohr and niels bohr gave almost the one of the most perfect atomic models okay niels bohr the postulates which he uh, discovered or the postulates which he made were later on studied and they were proved experimentally okay so niels bohr is the most uh, accepted uh, model of an atom there were other models also like sommerfeld's model of an all but we shall study all these different models in our nucleus chapter and at atoms chapter later on but this is just to give you an idea so one of the postulates of bohr says that the electron so if this is my nucleus okay then the electrons rotates around this nucleus only in those orbits whose angular momentum is quantized okay the electron rotates around this nucleus only in those orbits it cannot rotate in any arbitrary orbit okay anywhere uh, orbit here or here or here anywhere here here and there okay it can only rotate in those orbits whose angular momentum is quantized and has got a value of n h upon 2 i this is called as bohr's quantization principle okay it is one of the postulates of bohr's atomic model so as per that the electron if it has got an angular momentum if you calculate its angular momentum l is equals to uh, m e v r okay m e v r if you calculate this value and if this value is equal to this value where h is equals to 6.64 into 10 is to minus 34 and that's called as the planck's constant okay planck's constant so if you substitute this m e v and r value and if you get that value equal to this value in wherein you put some value of n 1 2 3 4 like that you put the value of h and 2 pi if this is equal to this then the electron rotates in that particular orbit okay okay that is called as quantization or discrete orbit nature okay so now so this as per this bohr's quantization principle in this case you only need to know this equation and this equation if i substitute back into this equation number 5 uh, the equation number 5 which we had if we substitute it there then we get a new constant that is called as bohr's magneton okay so if i substitute using l in equation number 5 mu l is equals to minus e by 2 me minus e by 2 me multiplied by l so if i substitute this l over here then what i get minus e by 2 me multiplied by n h upon 2 pi okay n h upon 2 pi mu l so if i substitute for hydrogen atom for a hydrogen atom n is equals to 1 that means the electron for the hydrogen atom lies in the first orbit 
for a hydrogen atom the electron is in the first orbit n is equals to 1 so the principal quantum number we call it in chemistry as a principal quantum number so for the principal quantum number for the electron in the hydrogen atom is equal to 1 so if i substitute that n is equals to 1 in this case in in this equation then this gives me 1.6 into 10 is to minus 19 divided by 2 multiplied by 9.1 into 10 is to minus 31 multiplied by 1 into 6.64 into 10 is to minus 34 divided by 2 into 3.14 if you calculate this what you will get is called as a boros magneton and the value of boros magneton is 9.27 into 10 is to minus 10 is to minus 24 ampere meter square this is called as bohr's magneton mu l is equals to this much is called as bohr's magneton yes it's called as this value is called as bohr's magneton or this constant is called as bohr's magneton if anybody has any question kindly ask So I have solved very few problems from this chapter. So after finishing this moving coil galvanometer, let me solve uh, problems related to all the topics that we have covered. Okay, we will solve. We will take two to three problem solving sessions after this concept of moving coil galvanometer. right so let me now draw the i hope you must have watched the video that i shared on moving coil galvanometer if you watch that video and you and if you understand the concept explained in that so that's it uh, nothing more to be explained and understood from moving coil galvanometer that is everything whatever is there in that video or in that animation is uh, how much there in your textbook okay so let me just draw that heading first moving coil galvanometer so there is a concave shaped magnet inside a galvanometer and this concave shaped magnets two concave shaped magnets produces a radial magnetic field okay, you will come to know what is a radial magnetic field soon okay so and this radial magnetic field obviously it will be directed from 
north pole to the south pole and the reason why this concave shaped magnets are used is to increase the strength or increase the intensity of the magnetic field at an iron core which is placed inside this okay so it is a cylindrical iron core so over here you will have a cylindrical iron core on which there will be a coil wound okay a conducting coil made up of copper will be wound to that which will have n number of turns and that coil if you wind it on a cylindrical surface it becomes a rectangular coil okay if you wind it on a cylindrical surface it becomes a rectangular coil and the core that is used is an iron core and why iron core is used to enhance the intensity of the magnetic field at the center and make the magnetic field lines radial okay when you make the magnetic field lines radial that uh, causes the magnetic intensity to increase okay and thus this coil when you place it inside this magnetic field the two wires of this coil are connected to some two ends okay there will be two ends like this two knobs will be there so uh, and one of the wire one end of the wire is connected from this coil over here and the other end of the wire is connected over here okay and this a uh, cylindrical core is fixed with two pivots and two springs okay two springs it is attached with two springs and there is a reading scale which is so there are two springs like this and this are connected to a deflection meter okay so as the coil rotates inside this magnetic field or as the coil experiences torque so whenever there is a current flowing through this coil okay whenever there is a so this is connected one end of is connected to one end of the wire and the other end of this coil is connected of this moving coil galvanometer is connected to the other end of the wire if you want to use it in a circuit for example if you want to use it in this circuit which has got voltage v r if you want to know whether there is current flowing through the circuit or not you will can connect a galvanometer over here okay and when so this is connected over here and this is connected over there and thus when there is whenever there is a flow of current through this circuit whenever there is current flowing small current flowing whenever there is small current flowing through that that current will flow through the coil that is bound on this uh, cylindrical surface and that is a rectangular coil okay that acts like a rectangular coil and since it is placed since because of the current flowing through that coil since it is placed inside a magnetic field it will experience a torque and it will rotate and thus this rotation will deflect the show deflection onto the meter okay that's the working and principle of the moving coil galvanometer it is explained in a much better way using animations in that video if you have watched it well and good if you haven't watched it you have to watch it again okay that gives you better understanding because they have shown the cross section of this galvanometer and what is actually there inside a galvanometer and a better explanation they have given in that video okay so you watch that video so thus due to the rotation of this rectangular coil inside this magnetic field Uh, there is a deflection it shows and thus you can sense the current or you can see whether the current is flowing or not if there is current flowing through this circuit okay if there is a current flowing through this circuit then 
there, there will be a current flowing through this coil and thus it will rotate and it will show deflection onto the scale that is placed. Okay, that is your moving coil galvanometer. And now, if we just do the equations of it, so let me just do some equations. So how much is the torque that is experienced by it? Tau is equals to M cross B. Okay. And from here, you know that this can be written as N I A B sine theta. Tau is equals to N I A B sine theta. And this theta is the angle between the magnetic field and the area vector, the magnetic field and the area vector. So now in this case, you see that if you place the coil like this, this is my coil that is wound onto a cylindrical surface. Okay, this is my rectangular coil. And if the magnetic field lines are radial to that, that means perpendicular to this area. So it will be the area will be somewhat like this and this magnetic field lines will be perpendicular to that okay this magnetic field lines will be perpendicular to the area area vector and thus this angle becomes 90 degrees in that case okay the angle is 90 degrees in that case such that whenever there is a flow of current i through this circuit whenever a current i flow flows through the coil, it experiences a torque and that torque is equals to tau is equals to n i a b sine of 90 degrees and sine 90 is equals to 1. So tau is equals to n i a b. This is equation number 1. This much is the torque that the coil experiences whenever a current i flows through the coil, through the rectangular coil of the moving coil galvanometer when it is placed inside a magnetic field B. Okay, magnetic field lines are radial. All right. So that's my equation number one. But we have seen in our 11th standard that there is something called as uh, rotational inertia. Okay, there is something called as rotational inertia due to which the, okay, let me not get into that rotational inertia and all. Let me just explain you in, in simple terms like this. So if this is my spring mass system, okay, if this is my spring mass system, then the position of this spring, okay, the force acting on this mass M, F is directly proportional to negative of the displacement from an equilibrium position. If there is some equilibrium position x is equals to zero here, then from the equilibrium position, the force acting on this mass is directly proportional to the displacement. Okay, this is called as a restoring force. This is called as restoring force, and the law is which we use here is called as the Hooke's law and this proportionality is removed by a constant k minus k x. This k is called as the spring constant. Okay, that means, this means what? This means whenever you displace this mass from, the, from its equilibrium position, when you displace it, it acquires some potential energy. Okay, this mass acquires some potential energy inside this spring and due to that potential energy, it exerts a force. Okay, it exerts a force on this mass due to that, due to which this mass is pulled back. Okay, and that is called as the, that force due to that potential energy is called as the restoring force. So this is for a linear motion. 
okay this mass is moving linearly it is in a straight path but whenever you have a angular displacement okay angular displacement of any object then in that case if this is the angular displacement of that of, of some object with mass m okay then this angular displacement again the torque acting on this object is directly proportional to the angular displacement here the linear displacement x and here angular displacement phi okay tau is proportional to phi tau is proportional to phi all right and this tau is equals to k times phi where k is called as the torsional constant okay it is called as the torsional constant all right again the same principle works the torque acting on the object tries to get it back to its original position okay the torque acting on the object tries to get it back to its original position if it if it has been displaced by an angular displacement phi tau is proportional to phi the ta torque acting on this object if it is displaced by an angular displacement phi that torque tries to get it back to its original position okay that's called as restoring torque in this case in linear case it is called as restoring force in the angular case it is called as restoring torque okay so thus this principle okay i have erased this tau is equals to n i a p question number 1 so whenever there is a rotation okay whenever the coil wound onto the uh, iron core experiences a torque there is a, a rotational inertia okay there is a restoring force that is acting which is directly proportional to its angular displacement phi okay the torque acting let me write it the torque acting on the rectangular coil is directly proportional to the angular displacement angular displacement from the mean or equilibrium position from the mean position that is tau is directly proportional to phi or tau is equals to k times phi where k is called as the rotational or torsional constant k is called as the torsional constant so thus if you just equate those two equations what you will get is n therefore by equating 1 and 2 very easy equations n i n i a b is equals to k times phi okay n i a b is equals to k times phi or if i just try to the other way around k phi is equals to n i a b and if i just bring this i on this side and take k that side it becomes phi by i is equals to n a b by k this quantity phi by i is called as the question number 3 this quantity is called as the current sensitivity current sensitivity 
of the galvanometer. This phi by I is equals to N A B upon K is called as the current sensitivity of the galvanometer. Okay, that's called as the current sensitivity of the galvanometer. And what is the definition for that current sensitivity is? Let me just write the definition also. So I think there is no need of this figure now. So what is current sensitivity? It is defined as the, it is defined as the deflection produced deflection produced in the galvanometer when a unit current flows through it when a unit current flows through it That is phi by i is equals to n a b upon k. Phi i phi by i is equals to n a b upon k, where phi is the amount of deflection that is produced when a current of unit magnitude flows through the galvanometer. So whenever you connect the galvanometer into a circuit okay whenever there is flow of current the flow of current is indicated by the deflection of the galvanometer okay there will be a deflection in the galvanometer and the current sensitivity how much it is sensitive how much the galvanometer is sensitive to the current that is called the quantity is called as the current sensitivity of the galvanometer okay and it is one of the parameters in deciding how much should be the sensitivity of the galvanometer to be used in which other which of the circuit so if a circuit has got very small current if you want to detect very small currents then obviously the sensitivity have to be low but if you want to detect the sorry if you want to detect a reasonable current then the sensitivity of the galvanometer also needs to be reasonable but if you want to detect very very small currents okay which is normally not detectable if you want to detect very small currents then you need to have a very good current sensitivity galvanometer that is the parameter and that's the a parameter used in deciding the current sensitivity of the galvanometer okay that is current sensitivity similarly you can get an equation for voltage sensitivity a galvanometer can also be used to detect voltage by some modifications to the circuit so you can write it as voltage sensitivity as another parameter associated with the moving coil galvanometer voltage sensitivity and it is defined as the deflection produced in the galvanometer when a unit voltage is applied across the two terminals of the galvanometer it is defined as the deflection deflection produced defined as the deflection produced in the galvanometer
when a unit voltage is applied across its terminals and how do you get the equation for the voltage sensitivity you can get it using your ohms law we know that v is equals to i r so i will be equals to v by r so in the same equation if i just substitute in place of i v by r v by r will be equals to n a v upon k and if you take this r on that side it becomes multiplied by 1 by r okay that is the equation for voltage sensitivity this is called as voltage sensitivity all right any doubt anybody has and the unit for the current sensitivity is radians per amperes or divisions per ampere divisions per ampere and here it is radians per volts or divisions per volts These are the units of it. Right. Let me take another five minutes and let me just do one problem. Any doubt? If anybody has, just to give you. the understanding of what is this what are these different parameters let me give you one question just to have a flavor of it just to feel the concept okay is that all right anybody has any questions kindly comment if you have any question this is your moving coil galvanometer a very very simple device simple working simple principle equations are also very simple so if at all it comes in the exam then it will be for three marks in which you will have to derive the equation for current sensitivity and voltage sensitivity that can be one of the questions and the other way the same questions can be asked is the applications of this moving coil galvanometer as a ammeter or as a voltmeter and that we will discuss in our next class okay moving coil galvanometer as a ammeter as or as a voltmeter so let us take this one problem very easy problem just to substitute and get the answers okay uh A rectangular, a rectangular coil of area five into ten is to minus four meter square and sixty turns is pivoted. the meaning of this pivoting you must have understood after watching the animation if you watch that animation you will understand what is this pivoting 60 turns is pivoted about one of its of its vertical sides about one of its vertical sides the coil is in a the coil is in a radial horizontal radial horizontal
फील्ड ऑफ नाइनटी गॉस वॉट इज द वॉट इज द टॉर्शनल कॉन्स्टेंट टॉर्शनल कॉन्स्टेंट वॉट इज द टॉर्शनल कॉन्स्टेंट ऑफ द हेयर स्प्रिंग द स्प्रिंग दैट इज यूज एट द पाइवर्ड्स इज कॉल्ड एज द हेयर स्प्रिंग वॉट इज द टॉर्शनल constant of the hair spring connected to the coil so whatever deflection whatever restoring torque i was talking about that restoring torque will be because of this hair spring okay this hair spring will create a restoring torque because there will be a potential energy that will be stored in this hair spring whenever there is a torque experienced by the coil which will try to bring it back to its original position okay uh hair spring connected to the coil if a current of 2 milli ampere produces an angular deflection of 18 degrees solve this question what should be the answer for this yeah what is the answer so let me just solve this okay so it says a rectangular coil of area 5 into 10 is to minus 4 meters squared and 60 turns 60 turns it has got 5 into 10 is to minus 4 meters squared is the area is pivoted about one of its vertical sides the coil is in a radial horizontal field of 90 gauss the magnetic field is 90 gauss what is the torsional constant that means what is phi phi is required to be calculated connected to a coil if a current of 2 milli amperes produces an angular deflection of 18 degrees so the same formula you will use phi by i is equals to n a b upon Okay, everything is given to you. You just need to calculate this phi. Okay, uh, torsional constant. Sorry, you need to calculate this k value. N is given. N is equals to sixty tons. Area of the coil is given. What is the area of the coil? It is five into ten is to minus four. What is the magnetic field B? B is equals to ninety gauss. And how to 
convert Gauss to Tesla from CGS to MKS units. The CGS unit of magnetic field is Gauss. If you want to convert it to uh, your MKS units, it will be 90 into 10 is to minus 4 Tesla. And you got N, you got A, you get you got B. What is the current? Current is I is equals to 2 milli amperes. So that is equals to 2 into 10 is to minus 3 amperes. And what is the deflection? Phi is the deflection that is 18 degrees. So in this equation, you just take this k over here and the other things that side. So k is equals to n a b i upon phi. So what is n? 60 multiplied by a 5 into 10 is to minus 4 multiplied by b 90 into 10 is to minus 4 multiplied by i is 2 into 10 is to minus 3 all divided by 5 that is 18 degrees. If you solve this, you should get some answer and that answer K, what is the answer and what is the unit? So you check what is the answer to that and let me know in the WhatsApp group. Okay, let, tell, tell me the answer along with the uh, unit in the WhatsApp group message, whoever solves. So that's it for today. We shall see in the next class. So last another two to three lectures, problem solving lectures I will take from this chapter and then later on we shall move on to the fifth chapter, Magnetism and Matter. That's it.